Uh, so this is Daniele Michancio from UCSD. I'll talk about lattice problems with small uh, parameters, a joint work with Chris uh, Pikert. So uh, most lattice cryptography used uh, today is based on a one-way function or uh, its variants proposed by ITI uh, some time ago. The function is described by a matrix A uh, with the integer entries chosen uniformly at random modulo Q. The input is a short vector uh, x, and the function simply uh, performs a vector matrix multiplication. So uh, it outputs uh, Ax. Now, in a remarkable result, ITI proved that this function for appropriate ranges of parameters that make the function compress its input is uh, hard to invert, and this has been the, base for, uh, the basis for many important applications ranging from hash functions to identification schemes and uh, uh, digital signatures, uh, uh, till today you will hear more about uh, signatures in this same uh, session. So, uh, um, just as popular, even more popular function based on lattices proposed by Regev called the learning with error function is similarly defined. It uses a matrix A chosen at random modulo Q, but this time it is a matrix with full column rank. Now, uh, the function uh, as defined this way uh, would be easy to invert using linear algebra. In order to make it hard to invert, you can add an error to its output. So this function, G, uh, takes as input two vectors, a secret S and an error E, and it outputs AS plus E again modulo Q. And the function was proved hard to invert uh, based on the worst case uh, um, harness of lattice problems. And it has been the basis of even more applications, including fully homomorphic encryption you just heard about. Now, uh, the two functions are indeed related. The, the syntactical difference uh, between the two functions is just a detail. The real difference is that one of the two functions is uh, compressing the input, the first one, because it is a smaller domain, the other one, it has a larger domain, while the LWE function is uh, injective because it has a smaller uh, domain. So it is possible to describe the two functions in a uniform sense setting using the same uh, uh, notation. Uh, so on, uh, on the technical level, uh, uh, this makes a big difference. The proof techniques used in the study of surjective or injective uh, lattice functions are quite different. But in this talk, uh, I will be using the first formulation of the functions to study both the SIS, which stands for Small Integer Solution Problem, which is the problem of finding collisions to ITI's function. And I will use the same notation also for the learning with error function. So um, both functions are based on the worst case harness of lattice problems in, uh, say, d-dimensional lattices. And uh, for uh, Regev, if we look at the parameters, which is uh, what we want to study, so you know, I'll be talking about uh, how the parameters affect the security of the functions. So in uh, Regev's function, uh, so the proof required the modulus Q to be at least the square root of the dimension. And the uh, error vector x, the input vector x, needed to be taken from a Gaussian probability distribution of standard deviation at least the square root of d. On the other hand, uh, uh, ITI's function uh, required, that, so the best to date modulus for that function is uh, bigger than uh, the LWE modulus. It has to be at least linear in the dimension. And, uh, but on the other hand, the error can be any uh, zero one vector. Even vectors with zero one coordinates uh, are uh, fine, and those are the vectors more commonly used as input to this function. So the questions we address are, uh, is the SIS function uh, secure even when you take a modulus as small as the square root of d, or uh, the dimension of the lattice? And is the learning with error function even when you take uh, uh, binary error vectors? 
and uh, uh, the answers that we provided to these questions are uh, positive. Now, these are interesting questions, both theoretically and in practice, because uh, on one hand, uniform uh, bit strings are much easier to sample than Gaussian distributions. And the smaller values of the parameters can be beneficial in many applications. And finally, getting an understanding of how the parameters affect the security provide us a better understanding overall of these lattice problems. And uh, what we show is that, uh, yes, the SIS function is hard even for moduli that are almost as small as square root of n. And the learning with error function is hard even for uh, binary errors. So these are just examples. We provide a more general class of results. And uh, so this second result is only proved when the number, the dimension m is sufficiently small. I will get back to this point in uh, a moment later in the talk. So let's start with ITIS function, the short integer solution problem. Now, the original result proved that the function is hard to invert for sufficiently large parameters. And originally, the modulus was quite big, and a sequence of work uh, took us to results showing harness for moduli that are almost as small as n, the lattice dimension. And the question is, can you bring it further down? And we address this question by giving a reduction from the uh, SIS problem to itself, but for different parameters. We show that if you can break this function for moduli that are as small, almost as small as square root of n, say modulus q, then you can also break the function for a modulus which is a power of q, say q to the c for some constant c. This allows you to break the function for larger moduli, which we know is hard from the previous results on the hardness of the SIS function. So so I'll, here I'll give a, a brief uh, uh, sketch of why this is true. The actual proof uh, is uh, quite a bit more uh, complicated than this, but I'll try to provide uh, um, the intuition of why you can uh, bring the modulus down to square root of n. Now assume for simplicity that the function is taking just binary inputs. And uh, assume that you can break this function for a certain range of parameters, for a given modulus Q on uh, uh, matrices with M columns. We show how to use, you can use this oracle that breaks this function, that finds collisions to this function, to break the same function, but for a larger modulus, for modulus Q square, by using a matrix that has M square columns. And this can be done by breaking this matrix into um, blocks, so you get M blocks, each one of them with M columns. So these blocks are similar to the one for which we can find collisions. But these are still uh, uh, matrices or modulo Q square rather than Q. So you can write each of these blocks in the basic QRE notation. You can express each one of them as a combination of two matrices modulo Q. A prime plus Q A double prime. So at this point, you can find a collision for each of the small matrices, and you can disregard the part that is multiplied by Q because we find collisions modulo Q. You can find an input which is mapped to zero. Using these inputs, you can uh, multiply the entire matrix, and if you check uh, uh, you know, the value that you obtain, you get uh, a value that is a multiple of Q. So you can divide it by Q and still get an integer vector. That's because the first component is uh, congruent to zero modulo Q, so you can divide it by Q, and the second component is multiplied by Q, so it is still uh, integer. Moreover, since uh, the, you found a collision without even looking at the A double prime part of the matrix, the result is still uniformly distributed modulo Q. So if you combine all these columns together, you will get a matrix which is uh, uniformly at random modulo Q, 
and it can be used again as input to your collision finding oracle and you can find a collision to this function. So by combining uh, these collisions together, so you get uh, basically a collision of collisions. Uh, when you multiply together uh, zero, one vectors, so the result is still uh, zero, one. So you get a vector with small components and that's uh, a collision to the original function defined by the mat big matrix A. Now, the actual proof is quite a bit more involved. It's based on the problem of discrete Gaussian sampling, and technically it is a reduction from the discrete Gaussian sampling problem to itself for different parameters, and I refer you to the paper for more details about this. But now let's move to the second problem, the learning with error problems, which is more widely used in cryptography. So, uh, and let's revisit uh, uh, what we know about it in terms of uh, harness. Now, uh, uh, Reger's result, uh, which uh, is uh, to a large extent uh, still the best, uh, the strongest result known for this function, requires the input to come from a Gaussian distribution with standard deviation sigma, which is at least the square root of d. And uh, um, for smaller values of sigma, the security proof breaks down. This was explained to some extent by a result of Aurora Engel, who showed that you can solve this problem efficiently in time exponential in sigma square. In particular, as soon as the standard deviation falls below square root of d, you get a sub-exponential time attack, which is unexpected. And uh, more specifically, in the 0, 1 error case, where sigma is a constant, you get a polynomial time attack. So this problem shouldn't be hard when you fix the error to 0, 1 vectors. So there is a catch, though. So this uh, attack, this algorithm, requires a uh, dimension m, which is very large. So this dimension is typically, co typically called the number of samples by analogy to some learning problems. And the number of samples required by the attack is at very least bigger than d square, and often even larger than that. So in order to make this question uh, uh, tractable, we can reformulate, we can give a refined version of the question, which is, uh, is the learning with error problem with the small standard deviation, in particular with zero, one errors, uh, hard when the number of samples, when the dimension m is kept uh, small, much smaller than uh, d square, where the problem becomes polynomial time solvable. Now, as a remark, so the question of the uniform input distribution has been studied also in a recent paper at Eurocrypt 2013, uh, which proves uh, harness for uniform error, but does not address the size of the errors. In fact, in order to get harness for uniform error rather than Gaussian ones, it uses errors which are even bigger than what was required by Regev's uh, original uh, proof. So uh, our proof technique uh, is based on a lossiness uh, argument. Uh, so uh, as a reminder, so there are some standard notion of uh, function inversion used in cryptography. So if you have a function f mapping x to y, the function is called uninvertible if it is computationally hard to go back from y to the original x. While a function is called uh, second pre-image resistant, if given x, it is hard to find a different input z that is mapped by f to the same output y. Now, neither of these uh, definitions gives you cryptographic security. In particular, the constant function is an invertible because it clears all the information about the input and the identity function is a second pre-image resistant. So if you take them by themselves, these are trivial uh, properties. However, if you combine them together, you get a very interesting uh, uh, notion, which is the standard notion of harness of inversion used in cryptography. So a function is one way if given y, it is harder to come up with any pre-image of y under the function f. And it is, it is easy to see that if a function is uh, at the same time both uninvertible and second pre-image resistant, which are not cryptographic notions uh, by themselves, then it is necessarily one way. And the reason is that if you can invert the function uh, according to the one-wayness notion, so given why you can recover any 
pre-image of y. So you can recover either the original x or a different value z. If you recover the original x, then you broke an invertibility. While if you recover z, then you broke the second pre-image resistance. So if you combine these two notions, you get the cryptographic harness. So uh, these notions uh, um, give you the, um, something called the lossy function family. Uh, this uh, is a um, cryptographic uh, uh, primitive originally proposed by Pikert and Waters, uh, who uh, defined it in the context of uh, trapdoor functions, uh, lossy trapdoor functions. Uh, here we don't even need trapdoors. So you can use uh, this definition for arbitrary functions, uh, and we use it uh, to prove uh, one wayness. So, by the same argument uh, showed here, if uh, you have, uh, so th this uh, definition requires uh, not one but two different uh, uh, families of functions, which are in distinguishable, so you cannot tell the difference between one and the other. One of them is an invertible, the other one is second pre-image resistant according to some distribution x. And given these properties, it easily follows that the function is necessarily one way, hard to invert. Now, I'll give a very brief sketch of how this is used to prove harness of LWE with small errors. So uh, I recall I'm, we, I'm using the uh, ITIS formulation of the problem. So the function is just matrix vector multiplication. So I'm going to define a lossy function family, so two family of functions, f and g, which are going to be uh, satisfied the definition with respect to the uniform bit string input distribution, y. And the first function is just the uh, SIS or LWE function. It's matrix vector multiplication for a uniformly chosen matrix modulo Q. The second function is similar, but instead of using a uniform matrix B, I use a matrix of the form A times X, where X is chosen with Gaussian entries with the standard deviation at least the square root of K, so that we know it is hard under the standard LWE assumption as proved by Regev. So uh, it follows that uh, these two matrices, B and AX, are uh, indistinguishable. This uh, follows by combining uh, the harness uh, of uh, the LWE search problem together with search to decision uh, reductions. So uh, the two functions are indistinguishable. And the second function is an invertible because uh, multiplying by AX can be described as the function composition of FX and FA. And fx is an invertible because it is multiplication by a matrix with small entries. So this matrix uh, is not that small. It can be as big as square root of k, but still these are small entries that uh, give you an invertibility. And composing an invertible function with an, ar an, an arbitrary function still gives you an uninvertible function. Now, the other uh, function in our family, f, uh, is uh, second frame image resistant, uh, and this follows from a standard counting argument uh, that is uh, roughly related to the fact that the knapsack density of the matrices A and B is about the same. So it follows uh, that this is a lossy function family, and therefore it is uh, one way. And you can translate this uh, to the standard LWE function obtaining these parameters I will talk about in this last uh, slide. So as a, uh, in summary, we proved that uh, these lattice functions are hard. You can always take the modulus uh, almost as small as square root of n, you get hardness. And the LWE function is hard even if you take small errors, in particular if you take binary errors. However, uh, our result only shows harness when m, the size of the matrix, is something that is slightly bigger than k. It is k plus some little of k uh, function. And some bound is required because if you go beyond the k squared, then the function becomes easy to invert. However, an interesting open problem is can you improve our result to, for example, uh, uh, dimension any constant multiple of k, order of k. This would be very interesting because this is pretty much all you need in efficient lattice-based uh, cryptography. And another problem is, uh, uh, well, uh, you can think of this uh, as a partial progress toward proving harness of the learning parity with noise problem, which corresponded to bringing Q all the way down to constant, say, 2. 
So thank you for attention, for your attention, and there's probably no time for questions. Okay.